Welcome and thank you all for coming. I'm Michelle Barbo of the League of Women Voters of Maine and South Orange. Co-sponsors of this evening's Board of Education Candidates Forum with the PTA President's Council. Uh, pres uh, Chairman R. John Lee Masters and Susie Adamson. And I'm on the member of the management team of the League. Um, the League is a trusted nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Elections and voting are core issues of the League. We are committed to providing fact-based information about issues and the positions candidates take on those issues to help voters make their own decisions and participate in the electoral process. To that extent, I urge you to become acquainted not only with the candidates running for school board and the various other positions on your ballot, but also the two ballot questions on which we will be voting on November 4th. There, is, uh, there are two of them in the back that you can look at, you can't take, but if you want further information, go to lwpnj.org and you will find it on the right side. You can click on information about the ballot questions. We have done an analysis, a pro and con for why you should or should not vote for those two issues. The deadline for registration for first time voters or those who have moved is tomorrow. Maplewood Township Clerk will be, uh, Clerk's Office will be open tomorrow night, Tuesday, until 9 o'clock for those who have to uh, hand in their voter registration forms. If you want to vote by mail application, those are also available in the back where you can download them from njelections.org. Uh, they must be received by your county clerk by Tuesday, October 28th, in order to vote for the, on the November 4th election. This form is being audio streamed on Sonore, S O M O R E dot org, as well as being re recorded for broadcast on local cable TV. So, Please refrain from speaking so we can hear the candidates and you won't be broadcast to others' homes. And now I would like to hear the music of everybody turning off his or her cell phones and other devices. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce the League Train moderator for tonight, Diane Gallo of the League of Berkeley Heights and Crawford Summit, who will explain tonight's format. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to our candidates. Um, we have a format set up through the league for tonight's program. Um, it's in several pieces. For those of you who have just walked in, um, if you are going to be wanting to ask a question of the candidates in the second or third portion of the evening, um, there will be cards out there. You can pick them up on that table. There are pencils. Um, those questions will be screened by the league and brought forward and asked of the candidates in that portion of the evening. We have four candidates with us tonight, very good people who are willing to give up their time and energy to make South Orange Maplewood a better school district. Elizabeth Baker is on the left, Maureen Jones is next to her, Dr. Godwin Malaku is up next to her, and Donna is on the far right. Each candidate uh, chose a number, a very simple process, a number out of a bowl, and that gave them the order of speaking for their opening statements. That number, that order rather, will be reversed for the closing statements. So to begin, the candidates each will make an opening statement about, of about two minutes, hopefully not any longer. And the first person to speak will be Elizabeth Baker. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and the President's Council for hosting tonight's debate. My name is Elizabeth Baker. I'm a 12-year resident of Maplewood with two children in district schools. I'm also a lawyer by profession, and I have expertise in negotiations, advocacy, public policy, and financial oversight. I'm running for the South Orange Maplewood Board of Education because I want to make sure that the vision we've adopted at Academy Street for excellence and opportunity for all children becomes the reality in every classroom, every day. 
My oldest daughter is in seventh grade at Maplewood Middle, and my younger daughter is in fourth grade at Tuscan. And we've had some great experiences in the district and teachers who've really made a difference in their lives, both as learners and as people. But as a parent, I've also seen the obstacles that stand in the way of creating great, vibrant learning environments that we want for our children. We've struggled with consistency from one school to the other and from one classroom to the other. Despite our goals of excellence, too many families and too many children still encounter a culture of low expectations and rigid systems that hold children back rather than lift them up. And then there's a lack of communication. It is unnecessarily difficult often to get basic information, and our schools and our district don't seem to invite feedback, let alone listen and learn, until an issue boils over. We can and must do better for our children. The search for a new superintendent provides us both with the challenge of finding the best leader for our district and the opportunity to take a, to take a good look at where we're strong and where we can do better. We have many strengths in our district, that we can build upon, but we also have challenges. In both my professional life and my volunteer here work in the district, I've taken on challenges, not just calling for change, but working with others to make change happen. Those are the skills and the commitment that I wish to bring to South Orange Maplewood and to our children in our district. Thank you. Thank you. I was remiss in uh, not mentioning our timekeeper, a very important person. Um, so if you would keep one eye on that person, um, when the yellow card goes up, it's a 30 second time limit. Okay, next is, next to speak is more, is, I'm sorry, next to speak is Dr. Godwin. Ladies and gentlemen, legal, the women for this time, President Council. My name is Dr. Godwin Moloko. I'm a resident of Maplewood for the past 17 years. I'm the first time I've been to Maplewood since 1970. I have four children presently in the public school system. I'm in private practice, gastrointestinal, especially internal medicine. I became involved in this because of some of the changes that has taken place. I recall when I moved down to, uh, from Philadelphia to Maple 17 years ago, the school system was much better. But before we proceed further, I was once a school teacher myself, so I know what it entails to have a good uh, school system. I was teaching a public school system in New York in the late 80s, math and science. So when I was looking for a place, to raise my children after I graduated from UMD and I started to settle down in Maple looking at all the school system. What has happened since then is mind-boggling. I get so disappointed. For those of you who keep record of where we were 17 years ago and where Columbia High School is today, you know why I'm running, okay? Enough is enough, guys. The school system has changed so much. No one cares about our children. The kids can't even write. They're flunking out teachers, abusing students. I'm not going to try to refresh your memory. What happened with one of the teachers and four students should never happen. Okay? There was a red flag. My daughter came home prior to this incident. He said that there's one teacher who was on a high heel, short skirt, flashing around, telling all the kids. I'm now free. I can do whatever I want. I get so disgusted. Yes, I have a very busy schedule. You know what I told her? I said, if it happens one more time, you let me know. I step into the school system. If I have to call the state, such teacher should not be teaching our children. I'm running to bring changes. Enough is enough. And I, I mean, if you look at my past, I was one of those people who make this happen. And I'm going to use all my effort to make sure that such a thing should never happen again. And those teachers have no place in teaching our children. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next to speak is Donna. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters and the PTA President's Council <coughs> for uh, hosting this event. And thank you all for coming to listen to our views. Um, my husband and I have lived in South Orange for almost 25 years now. We've raised three children who all went through the school system in, in this district from kindergarten through 12, and our youngest just graduated last year. I have been actively involved in the school district for about uh, 16 years, 16, 17 years, being involved in the PTAs at each of the schools. I was uh, co-president of South Mountain PTA. I worked um, 
uh, the directory for the middle school, not the directory, the uh, newsletter for the middle school and the directory for the high school. I uh, then became co-president of President's Council and sat in this chair. And uh, during that time, I was asked to participate in some of the committees for hiring district personnel, and I participated in the strategic <coughs> planning process. Uh, since then, I also uh, participated in the, um, the Task Force on Excellence and Equity as a representative of Levels Can Work, which is one of the parent organizations that I helped spearhead to challenge the district to maintain rigor in the coursework at the middle schools. I'm also a customs and international trade lawyer, and I also am an adjunct professor at Brooklyn Law School in the spring semester. Uh, I would like to put my leadership skills and my expertise into uh, work on the Board of Ed. I, time for me to take up that challenge after um, my son graduated from high school, I feel like I have the time to do this. I would like to see more opportunities for all students to have access to challenging coursework. We need improved professional development in the area of differentiated instruction for the teachers at the earliest um, learning levels from elementary through middle school. I also would like to ensure that access to AP and honors courses Thank you. And now Maureen. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maureen Jones, and thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and President's Council for the opportunity to participate. I know what it's like to struggle, and I also know what it's like to be an outsider. My family emigrated from Haiti to the United States when I was seven years old, and I vividly remember sitting in a classroom, not understanding the language, and having to watch other students for cues to figure out what was going on. But I also remember having teachers who supported me, who encouraged me, and helped me become successful. I ended up flourishing in school and became a speech-language pathologist. As a speech-language pathologist, I've had the good fortune to work in different districts. Through working in different districts, I've been able to observe different approaches in which education is happening. I am running because we need to make sure every child gets whatever help they need and that every child experiences rigor, challenge, and opportunity in every classroom. Finding the right way, not just for English language learners or special needs students, but for all students in everything requires a superintendent and a board that's able to translate educational vision into effective delivery of programs and services. Good things are happening in the district, but we also know we have our challenges. We must enable children to succeed, and we must always have consistently high expectations for them. We must enable families to succeed by providing them with the proper resources to help them navigate the system, and we must enable teachers to succeed by giving them the support and the mentoring that they require in order to help handle the IB and Common Core. And we must be patient. And we must get all teachers to look at each child as an individual to get them engaged and to help them challenge in everything that they do. Thank you. We now move on to the second portion of the evening where the League of Women Voters has posed several questions to the candidates. Um, I will read the first one and the order of speaking again was chosen by lot. The first question. What are the most important leadership qualities that you feel the new superintendent must have? What should be his or her focus? What skills would you rate as the most important? And be specific. The order of speaking was, again, Elizabeth Baker to go first. Luck of the draw. We need a superintendent who, frankly, is a total package. Someone who's an educational leader, who's a great manager, and who's a good communicator and who can work collaboratively with all stakeholders in our district. But there are four qualities I really think it's important to focus on. First, we need a superintendent who understands the importance of, of building and developing and mentoring a great leadership team. No one person can do it alone, and no one person knows everything. Second, the superintendent must be committed to the professional development and mentoring of teachers, particularly newer teachers. Professional development is not something we should be doing a couple of hours a month or a few days a year. It must be woven into the fabric of our schools and everyday life. Third, 
Our superintendent must be someone who can create management structures that ensure the effective delivery of great instruction in every classroom, and also that create systems of ownership for the work and accountability. And finally, communication is key. The superintendent sets the example and is the role model for the entire district. Our superintendent must be a good communicator and he or she must be someone who invites people into the conversation, soliciting feedback, learning from feedback, and creating dialogue. I don't think it's an easy recipe, it's a, you know, but we are a unique district and we are, despite our challenges, a district that I think someone who is this total package should want to join. Thank you. Thank you. Now the other candidates each have a minute if they wish to respond to this question. Um, and the order of speaking would be uh, Morning Jones with, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Donna Smith again comes in second if you would like to respond for a one minute response. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I believe that we need a visionary with the skills necessary to handle the complexities facing our district. We need someone who's able to implement programs effectively, and we need someone who's a good manager and who understands the teaching profession. A number of people have expressed the need for a superintendent who is a visionary, and I agree, but in the sense of being able to view all of our district's challenges and address them creatively and strategically. We have a number of new initiatives and programs being implemented in the district, and a history of just plunging ahead without appropriate evaluation. We are in the process of implementing IB in the middle schools, the Common Core, the Park Assessments, Teach NJ procedures, all while fixing a looming deficit. This visionary therefore needs to have a number of strengths that can help meet these challenges, not the least of which is how to manage the budget. I think the superintendent also should have a good understanding of this teaching profession and be able to provide the appropriate support for teachers during these challenging times. We've had tremendous turnover in the district and they need their support of the superintendent. Thank you. Um, Maureen Jones speaks next. We are at a real crucial and critical point in our district because the new superintendent hired will shape our district for many years to come. We need a superintendent who, one, gets us, and two, is able to say no when the board asks for too much at once. People move to our community because we are a unique and diverse district. While that diversity is the strength, it is also part of the challenges. So the superintendent we hire needs to truly get this district and implement a vision for excellence while having our students develop a passion for learning. Furthermore, the superintendent needs to create a culture that is built on trust and integrity and foster strong relationships with the board, administration, staff, and parents. Thank you. And Gordon Malcolm. Thank you. If you look around the district right now, you ask yourself, what are the challenges? Well, it depends on who you talk to. We are expecting to have a new superintendent. The first thing that comes to my mind is leadership skill, communication, someone that everyone can trust. Guys, none of my candidates mention trust. Trust is very important. Yes, communication. If you can't communicate, we can't solve our problems. We can't even talk to one another. So communication is well on the list. But we need someone who has demonstrated that they can lead. Leadership is very important. I don't care whether you are once a school teacher, a principal, or Congress, somebody from nowhere. We don't have time to waste. The district is not doing well. We need someone who's gonna come in and get straight to the job and get it done right. I don't have the patience. Parents don't have the patience. Our money is being wasted. Administrators are getting paid so much money for doing nothing. I need your vote. I'm going to get involved in this because I'm going to change things around. Trust is very important. Leadership, managerial skills, and someone who can get worked out. Guys, it's very important. There's no more time for business as usual. We need to start that. Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. The second question. The school district is at full capacity now. With municipal development, there will be a larger student population. How will you address the demands of increased enrollment? And Godwin Monk, who goes first on this one? Thank you, ma'am. You know, it sounds like this is good news. We want to increase the population in our school system. Take a look at all the properties we have. The district has so much empty properties. 
we have to utilize them. Guess what? I'm so afraid of what's going to happen. They're going to get an outside vendor. Who's going to come in, come in with all these crazy budgets? We're going to bust the students to a different district. You know what they're going to do? They're going to waste your money and the taxes go up. We're going to put stop to this nonsense. District, you know, guess what? We have so many empty properties around. Make use of what we have to its full capacity and stop wasting taxpayers' money. Take a look at this. Every year, uh, property taxes go up. When you add what happened, well, we invest so much money on the schools system, the police. Yes, we get the police, but what we don't have is good school system. We need to change things around, guys. Columbia High School used to be one of the best. We are one, we are one of the best AP uh, uh, classes. Not anymore. Look where we are today, 96. That's a shame. If we were 96, 17 years ago, guess what? I wouldn't be in this town. Education is very important to me, and we need to use what we have to its full capacity. And we need to prevent outside vendors coming in. That's what's going to happen. They're going to come in with all this budget advisory, and they're going to pass this to go up. It's not going to happen on my watch. I promise you that. Thank you. Thank you. And now the other candidates can you respond for a minute. And the person who would go next is Maureen Jones. The district is already addressing capacity issues at our schools. This includes the addition at Midwood Middle School, as well as being in the middle of Columbia High School's renovation plan. Also, by moving the preschool to the Marshalls building, it is freeing up space at Marshall, Jefferson, and South Mountain. The district should continue to collaborate with the downship to ensure that more de as more developments are being built, that there's discussions about what projections will happen. What I do know is that we can't compromise on class size. We have to continue to look at the utilization of our properties and ensure that space and capacity is being used effectively. Thank you. And now Donna Smith, please. Um, I agree with uh, what Maureen was saying, that we are addressing the issue, and uh, one of the things that happened is that the board authorized the administration to utilize soft boundaries for the elementary schools so that, the, that adjustments can be made annually, and hopefully that will continue to help with the situation. But one thing that I think maybe we should consider is reinvigorating the Seth Boyden Demonstration School and getting more people to opt into that school. I think that would help ease the burdens at the elementary school level as well. Uh, maybe create a different uh, type of magnet um, or just simply focus on the multiple intelligences concept there and make it make it better and more attractive to, to more uh, parents of students in the district. So I would like to see that. Thank you. And Elizabeth Baker, please. The future of our towns and our schools are intertwined. Our towns cannot thrive if we're trying to grow in a way that does not support our schools. We need to increase our tax base for sure, but we need to make sure that as we grow, we're not, uh, that we're generating enough revenue to pay for the expenses and the increased pressure on our school. First, I think we need to start by understanding the development that has already happened. How many units have been built? How many families are in those units? How has our enrollment already grown? And how many and how many young children are going to be entering our schools. Second, as our towns are giving out pilots, payment in lieu of taxes, we need to make sure that there are sufficient resources and commitments to support our schools. And third, I think our towns and our school district need to engage in coordinated planning discussions. We have a structure that existed in the budget process, the Board of School Estimate, that provided some coordination between our towns and our schools. We need to take that same approach which to, to Sorry, to planning and development. Right now, there is very little discussion, and we're not going to grow and survive, if, you know, thrive, if, if we don't start that, that dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. The third question. What is your position on the International Baccalaureate Program as it is now implemented in the middle schools? Should this be expanded into the high school? And the first person to answer will be Maureen Jones. The IB program incorporates and infuses best practices of teaching while also bringing together a common language across all classes and therefore ties in an interdisciplinary focus. I have heard from some parents and educators that IB has been beneficial to our sixth graders and some really good learning experiences have been happening to their children and students. 
However, the 2013 and 2014 school year was the first year of implementation. And any time we roll out a program, it needs time to develop through child and error and continued investment in teacher development and practices. We need to continue to analyze our successes and kinks, see what works, what doesn't, how we can improve on that. So before we can even pose the question of bringing IB to the high school, we need to ensure that it is up and running smoothly at the middle schools and that we're examining data and findings from the first few years. Therefore, a fully functioning IB middle years program that passes external review by the IB organization is certainly a number of years away. Thank you. And now for the one minute responses, the first person to, the next person to speak will be Gavin Mom. IB program, it sounds interesting, it sounds sexy, it sounds great. When you compare to AP, there's a lot of yes and no. Presently, if you look at AP classes, kids who participate in the AP classes do get college credits. And if you look at IB, they don't. It's a new program. There's still a lot of challenges ahead of us. Hasn't been, as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't been taken up to five to ten years to see what's going to happen. To impose IP, uh, IP to high school at this present time would be the biggest mistake. Okay, I think kids need to concentrate in the high school level in getting what they needed to move further in education. Presently, it's not like a great idea to have IB in elementary school and middle school. I think presently, I would vote for that, but to right now, trying to interfere with AP classes, I think it's too soon to do that. Thank you. Um, and now Elizabeth Baker, please. Sure. I support the IB Middle Years Program. It's a proven model that is consistent with our district values and our, and our common core objectives. With the daughter in the middle school who's in the first wave of IB as we, as we implement the program, I've seen the energy and the critical thinking that IB adds to our schools. That being said, we're still in the early phase and we, we need to understand where we're succeeding and we need to have hard discussions about where we can be doing better. I think most of the uncertainty about the middle years program stems from the larger, more systemic issue we have in the district of poor communication. Before we began implementing IB, there were many workshops for parents whose children were about to enter the program about what the goals were about how it was going to be implemented. And we heard much about the external assessments. Since we began implementing, we've heard very little from the district. And I think that is fueling much uncertainty and potentially anxiety. We need to have that information and we need to have those discussions and before we consider rolling IB out to the high school. Thank you. Thank you. And now Donna Smith, please. Thank you. The administration clearly needs to provide more information on the effectiveness of the implementation of the Middle Years program, whether it is accomplishing the goal set of the program and what its costs are. If we're committed to ongoing implementation of after that evaluation, parents and students need to be better informed about the nature and purpose of the IB program. And finally, at this time, I agree that I do not believe that the IB should be extended to the high school until we've gone through that process with the middle school years. While I like the concepts of the IB program, a holistic approach to learning, emphasizing critical thinking and global perspective, uh, we have not received any objective reporting as to how it is being implemented at the middle school. I look forward to hearing the report from the administration at the next board meeting, and hopefully we'll also hear more about what the costs are um, and the ongoing costs, because in addition to professional development and IB, there are annual costs that, that go along with it um, per school fees that have to be paid, and also per student per course fees that must be paid as well. Thank you. And now for the last of the prepared questions from the League and the President's Council. Maplewood and South Orange take pride in our diverse ethnic and socioeconomic population. What equity issues should be the board's priority in the near term? And the first person to speak is Donna Smith. Thank you. I believe the best way to address equity issues is by making it our top priority to challenge all students from the students with special needs, to those who are struggling academically, to those who are high achievers, and to those who are gifted and talented. 
starting at the earliest stages of their education. We also need to provide professional development for the elementary and middle school teachers in differentiated instruction, where the classes are mostly leveled, addressing the achievement gap at the earliest stages. Finally, we need to provide increased access to AP and honors classes at the high school when those students who have hopefully been given more challenge in the earlier years will be able to rise up to those classes. At practically every superintendent search forum, we've heard parents complain that their children are not being challenged, and this was at every kind of forum, for middle school, for elementary school, for high school, uh, for the parents of students of African descent. Every single one of those forums, we heard the same complaints. We need to challenge all students. I also strongly believe in providing increased access to honors and AP classes at the high school. We cannot afford to not allow students into those classes simply due to um, scheduling issues or the fact that they don't have, uh, have enough offerings. If there aren't enough offerings, open up more. Um, this is critical to the, the whole culture of our, our towns. And thank you very much. Thank you. And now Elizabeth Baker, please. I'm committed to challenge and opportunity for all children in our district. And I think the steps we need to take to achieve greater equity are changes that will benefit all children and all families. This is not about my kids or your kids or someone else's kids. Every child pays a price, both educationally and psychically, when they're in a system that repeatedly leaves some children behind, that tolerates wasted years and lost opportunities. These issues, some of which were laid bare in last week's ACLU complaint, are, is, are issues that our district must own and address now. We need structural changes, and we need a change in the climate within our schools. On the structural side, we need to look at, this, at the systems in our schools and the curricular paths that they lock children into. Secondary math is a, is a primary example. In addition to expanding access to AP classes and honors classes, which requires greater capacity and encouraging students <coughs> to take those risks and support them, we also need to do, take the hard and practical look at the elementary schools so that we're stopping the achievement gap before it begins. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Mahu? Yes, hi. Thank you. If you look at the equity issues surrounding the school district, I think one can easily say when we look at we got two dimensions. Those kids that are doing well and those kids that, that are barely surviving. Our parents are upset, worried. Why do we have to invest on those kids who are doing well? I'm listening to my colleagues here. Levin, my kids participated in that, they did well. AP classes. We need to look at those children, guys. I thought this is just common sense. Look at those kids who are not doing well, who need support at home. The school district needs to find a way to support them. When we talk about 98% graduates, what about the 2% who are not going to be graduating? Do we have to invest on 98%? No! We need to put our emphasis on those kids who are not doing well. Okay? And if we have to get involved in, in group studies, we have to have school programs, we should open the door for all the kids at the end of the day or end of the year to participate in AP classes. Those who pass the exams, we should make sure that there, there are classes, classroom for them. All right? So putting more emphasis on those who are not doing well will be my priority. And we shouldn't waste time on the kids who are doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Maureen Jones, please. I look around the room and I see one common thread. We are all here because we are vested in our district and we want to see our children succeed. True success only happens when the superintendent, the board, the administrators, and teachers truly see the value of every ch child learning and rising to the occasion. As Elizabeth and I have been meeting members of the community, we have heard many issues of families that have had successes, as well as challenges and conflicts. Every parent wants their children to be truly seen by teachers in the classroom. Every parent wants to see their children become successful learners. And that can only happen when all children are seen as capable learners, regardless of socioeconomic status 
race, special needs, or gifted and talented. As we have mentioned in our partnering with Parents Peace that posted in our website, a shift in cultural mindset is really required in our district in order for those changes to start happening. Thank you. Now we move on to the portion of the evening where the audience has submitted questions. Um, these are um, one minute answers for each candidate. Some of them have been directed specifically to the candidates, others have been general. So I'm going to start with a general question, and in order of speaking, you will each have one minute to answer. How will you work at the state level to advocate for our district and overturn the superintendent's salary cap so that we can attract a committed, experienced superintendent and retain him or her for an extended period of time? And the first person to speak would be Elizabeth Baker. There are districts like ours all over the state of New Jersey that are immediately and directly impacted by the superintendent cap. There are dozens of districts that are like us are trying to find a new leader for their district and are having challenges because superintendents and the most qualified candidates have fled to other states. Clearly, this is the, an area where we should be working in coalition with other impacted districts. There is legislation that has been addressed in them, and this is something we need to drive. Our district has certainly a lot of advocates, it has a lot of resources, and we are in the capacity to work with our elected officials to take on this issue and to play a leadership role. That being said, as we hire the next superintendent, even without the cap, I think we should make sure that we're engaging in the best practices with respect to leadership compensation. It doesn't mean that without a cap, we should not be judicious in our compensation package, but we should, in these times of you know, fiscal constraints, we should continue to make sure that we're using every dollar wisely, but removing the cap is the very first and essential step. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to respond to that? Um, as you may have noticed, I, I'm very much in favor of fiscal responsibility, but I too agree that the superintendent salary cap has been a, a problem for us. Um, I understand the concept for the original movement towards that cap, but um, the limitations are quite, quite difficult to, to, for us to deal with. And so um, I too would be uh, willing to work with uh, our representatives in Trenton to try to change that. And hopefully the new legislation that is being considered by the Education Committee will move forward. Um, we really need to see some action on that. It is due to expire, I believe, next year, and so um, the question is whether they were going to extend it, so let's hope that they do not. Maureen Jones? I would agree with Elizabeth and Donna. Um, we have to really work with our legislators to be advocates on this and see how we can push forward for this salary cap. It is something that we are dealing with as well as many other districts in New Jersey. And we have to really see how, as board members, that we can reach Trenton and have our voices heard so that they can see that the impact that the salary cap may be having in hiring effective and quality candidates throughout New Jersey. Thank you. And Dr. Malcolm? Well, my colleagues, I think uh, everyone can talk and agree with that. Okay. But again, we have to look at what is going on in our district and compare that to other districts. We, we shouldn't waste too much money because we want the best superintendent to come in. We can use all the influences we have, both at the state and local level, to negotiate for the salary, uh, salary cap. So the idea of um, uh, capping the salary, and because of that, we close the doors for best qualified candidate, something that we may have to change. Okay, that's, that's my point. Thank you. The next question. Given budget cuts and shortfalls, how would you ensure that special teachers, librarians, gym teachers, art teachers, music teachers, etc., are not reduced as we are beginning to see shared resources between schools in these areas? And the first person to speak would be Governor Malcolm. You know, there's a lot of uh, special needs children. I can tell you, see some of them that are very close to me, my cousins, and you know, to, to we, these children need help. To reduce the services that these children need would be atrocity and it's, it's, it's immoral. We need more of those librarians, special aid uh, teachers, 
to have these kids, if we integrate them with the rest of the children, like myself, what the teaching experience, it's very hard for them to cope with. So we need more of those teachers and not less of them. If we have to invest on them, I think I will be for that. We need more special aid teachers, librarians, because the future of our children, I can tell you this, depends partly on that. Maureen Jones, would you like to respond? The arts are really a really important part of our curriculum. We see so many children who benefit from the arts, who it helps them learn and reach in different areas. And we really, it's really important to be an advocate for the arts because we see how strong it is. Here we are in a community that is full of artists and represents so many artists. So we really need to be strong advocates for the arts program and make sure that it continues in our district. Um, and we really need to make sure that we keep cuts away as much as possible. Thank you. Donna Smith, please. Um, obviously, our community cares very much about music and the arts, and we all would like to maintain um, the quality of programming that we've had in the past. Um, there have been some issues lately with the middle school music program, and I think that has been due to more of a scheduling issue rather than budget, and so I would like to see that review um, as soon as possible so that maybe next year we can uh, revert back to uh, the, the number of sessions that we had um, in the music program for the middle schools. Um, but yes, we, obviously we all support librarians, music teachers, art teachers, and want to keep them as much as possible. We have to try to look at other aspects of the budget that we can work with that doesn't involve eliminating those special teachers, um, but it is going to be a difficult budgetary time for us. Elizabeth Baker, please. I'm not sure that everyone knows, but in this current budget year, we eliminated more than 13 teaching positions in the district. And some of those impacted positions were arts positions, but they were also special education positions. And this is why dealing with our financial constraints is imperative. The math and the 2% cap are, doesn't add up for our district. And what we've begun to see, if we don't find a solution in Trenton and find a way to harness the, fi the financial resources we have, is a, is a trajectory that none of us wants to you know, path none of us wants to go down. Uh, with respect to preserving these programs, which are really vital for the whole child and you know the comprehensive education, I do think we need to talk more about bringing in extra funding. Our physical education department has been very successful in bringing funding in through the PEP grants. I have not heard, despite our commitment to the arts um, in, the, in this community, I have not heard a similar effort uh, to engage in fundraising and grant writing to support our continued uh, and vibrant arts program. Thank you. Thank you. Third question. What do you know about the budget cycle, its planning, and its challenges? And how do you propose to meet those challenges when you have to make those cuts? And Maureen Jones, if you'd like to go first. As I'm continuing to learn about the budget, um, I've learned that we really need to start investing earlier in our kids rather than later on. The budget is real. We have to show fiscal responsibility by providing services and programs that address different needs from the time children are in the elementary school rather than waiting through the middle of a high school to spend more money in those areas. Um, when we address the needs at an earlier stage, then we are showing much more fiscal responsibility that way. And then we can really watch our tax dollars and see how we're spending money throughout, um, throughout the year. Thank you. Governor Malcolm, please. Thank you. If you look at the budget and see, look at all the expenses at the end of the year, you see, you can tell where we need to make some responsible cuts. The district wastes so much money, I'm not going to even start telling you where because they have them online. They waste so much money, your money and my money, in doing crazy things. They need to be invested in children. Yes, some, some of them even take unnecessary vacations, uh, unnecessary uh, educational classes that cannot even be explained. If you want to do those things, you pay for your pocket. We need to start investing money, even in bonds and securities, which will benefit the children, and stop cutting unnecessary 
expenses where they shouldn't be. We invest our children. If you want to take vacation, spend your money. If you want to take uh, continuing education, which is welcome, spend your money and not and not wasting our money. So budget cycle, we need to look at that. We need to look where irresponsible expense, uh, expenses are made. And we should stop them. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Baker, please. Sure. Uh, Understanding the budget and the decisions we make is something that I immersed myself in last year as a member of the Schools Committee on the Citizens Budget Advisory Commission. And I have a couple uh, takeaways from that. First of all, I think we need to work on the budget year-round. It's not something that we should just kind of cram through between December and March. It's a process that we should be talking about year-round as we look both at what we anticipated our expenses to be and, and understand where the money has to go over the course of the year. Also, one of the largest areas of our budget is healthcare expenditure, and we've talked about double-digit increases. As a labor lawyer, I work with healthcare every day, and I negotiate over healthcare. I firmly believe that our district employees and that all the employees working in our district should have access to quality, affordable healthcare. I don't understand why we have double-digit increases when the state plans are not increasing at the same rate. I think we have to understand better whether our district is bearing the cost of health care as other employers have shirked their responsibility. And I think we also have to look at the effectiveness of incentive programs that we've offered to employees who have other health care options. Thank you. And Donna Smith, please. As a longtime board watcher, I, I do know that the board is considering the budget pretty much year-round. Um, they have to because it's so complex and there are so many stages at, at uh, each um, stage. The board has to do certain reports to, to the state. Um, and so it doesn't just start in December. They really have to start thinking about it much earlier on. Um, we do need to look at alternatives to expensive programs. And I, um, I'm really grateful that the board has uh, formed a task force on the health care costs because I think it's important to look at that. As it was said, the health costs are really um, quite high, and uh, we really need to examine that. It's a big driver of the budget. But there are other things that we can look at as well, and I think we have to do that if we want to continue to, to um, maintain the academic portion of our budget and, and also the arts and the music and other things that we care about so much. So we really need to examine thoroughly what's being spent. Thank you. Elizabeth Baker? I'm sorry. <laughs> you did. No, okay. You all did. Okay. There you go. Okay. So it's time for another question. Getting mixed up. Trying to read the questions at the same time. Sorry. Uh, this one was actually um, directed to you, Donna. But um, quite frankly, it's something that I think all of you would like to answer. Um, it says Donna Smith mentioned quote tremendous turnover quote of teachers. What ideas do you have for retaining the great teachers we do have? And I think, obviously, this is something you would all want to answer, but if you would like to go first, since it was directed to you. Uh, this is one of the things that we, we would like to see in a new superintendent is a good manager, someone who can support the teachers, who understands the teaching profession, and whose uh, decisions are, who makes sure that the decisions made by the super are conveyed down through the administration to the teachers, and that teachers are, are respected and given the opportunity to, to work with the administration on implementing new programs, um, bringing in new ideas, uh, working on curriculum. We need to give those teachers that respect in order for them to want to stay here and continue working here. And so um, this is going to be a critical element to the superintendent, someone who clearly understands the teaching profession and can assist them. Um, and with the turnover, it is going to be difficult because there's so many new faces in, in the district right now. Um, we need to provide them with all the support that we can. Thank you. And now it was with Baker. Some turnover right now is inevitable because we are at the beginning of a wave of baby boom retirements. We've also been hiring many new teachers as our enrollment has expanded. So I think we have two challenges. Retaining and providing support and respect for our master teachers and career paths so that they feel that they can stay, grow, and advance within our school district. I think that's key. We also need to work on developing effective training and mentoring programs for our new teachers 
Teachers enter our district well-intentioned, hardworking, and pretty dedicated and selfless. What are we doing with them? How are we supporting them? How are we pairing them with master teachers so that they can grow, thrive, and, and make this district their home for, for many years to come? Thank you. Godwin, Malaku? Well, good teachers, put it this way, could be infectious to the bad teachers in a good sense. Yeah, you'd be surprised, they can influence bad teachers and make them good teachers. So we have to find a way to influence them. How can we do this? Incentives, rewards, policies can be given to teachers at the end of the year. We have the same thing. Look at the nurses. The nursing year award. A lot of nurses want to get an award. Okay? It comes with a price. So every, beginning from January 1st, all the nurses in the hospital, if you ask them, what do you want? I want my name on that board. So, when you have a good teacher, they can be infectious in a good sense. If every teacher wants to be recognized at the end of the year. So, if we have bonuses and awards and rewards, I think that would be very helpful. And keep those teachers here. We need them. We don't want bad teachers. We want to get rid of them. Okay? We don't want teachers to abuse kids. Let them go somewhere else where they belong, not in our district. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen Jones, please. Attracting and retaining teachers should be a key focus for our district. We need to support our teachers. We need to encourage them. We need to provide the proper mentoring that they need to help them to, um, handle the curriculum and deal with the challenges that may be faced in the classroom. Um, through professional development, we can see them continue to grow in their skills and in their subject area. The superintendent should also really um, get to develop a relationship with teachers so that as new approaches are being implemented, teachers can feel supported in that process and through that transition. Thank you. Next question. What are the top six metrics the board should evaluate on a monthly and an annual basis in your opinion? And the first person to speak is Elizabeth Baker. Six. Okay. <laughs> um, that's what that's what <laughs> I think we have to have metrics for evaluating what's happening in our classrooms that are more immediate and more practical and more real than test scores that we review six months after the kids take the test. So we have to find a way to work with our educational leaders in each school and teachers to develop to develop effective means for, for gauging what's going on in the classroom. Obviously, I think we need to have much uh, better and more transparent contemporaneous reporting as to what's happening with our money. Where, where are we compared to our budget? I think we also need to have metrics where we're talking about what other districts that are facing similar challenges are doing and how they're doing it differently than we are. So that we understand, are we following best practices? Are we ahead of the curve? Or should we be looking to other districts to see what they're doing and where we can do it better? Uh, Going on, I think we should look at what's happening with our teachers, our young teachers, as well as our more seasoned teachers. How are we developing them? What's going on in their schools? And how do they feel about their experience? I think that was four. It's hard to get six in one minute. <laughs> well, let's do the best we can. Um, Donna Smith, please. Yeah, that's a challenge. Um, I think that we need to uh, Every, every month evaluate whether we're following our board policy, whether the decisions we've made co are coincide with those policies, um, whether the decisions we make involve wise spending, whether the teachers are being supported with um, adequate training and um, professional development, one of the key things that we've, we've addressed tonight. Um, about four. <laughs> um, what, 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 um, I think we need to make sure that um, we are addressing the needs of, of all students. So we need to, in addition, get reports on how the special ed students are being um, uh, given the, the support in the district that they need. Um, if, we're, if we implement a gifted and talented program, how is that being implemented? Thank you. Maureen Jones, please. 
Sure. Some of the things the district should be looking at is our communication. How are we communicating with our families? How are we communicating with the district? How is information being delivered? We also need to look at how we're measuring cur curriculum as new programs are being implemented. What me metrics are we using to measure them and see how successful they're being? Um, we also look at, need to look at our special education process and see how services are being implemented from the beginning of the referral process to the time that services are approved. We also need to look, um, make sure that we're spending our budget wisely and we also need to make sure that we are providing our teachers with the support and what kind of support is being offered to them in the classroom. Thank you. Governor Mullenkin, please. Well, I mean, thanks. One can come up with 10, 15 metrics. It depends on in the order. Look at the lateness, the attendance, the skills, okay? Students should begin to evaluate the teachers. I think, I think it would make sense to have a, a at the end of every quarter, have the students evaluate their teachers and the district need to look into those. Alright? So the budgetary uh, constraints. How do we spend our money? We can't wait till the end of the year or every six months. We need to look at every quarter to see what is going on. Okay. Thank you. Next question. What do you feel the district should do to mitigate the socioeconomic disparities at the elementary schools. Latest numbers show that South Mountain's free and reduced lunch population is 5%, while Seth Boyden's is nearly 40%. Governor Mullen was the first one to answer this. Socioeconomic issues will always be a problem in the school system for those who were involved. I was part of it. It's a shame. You'd be surprised, for instance, some kids don't even participate in the lunch program because you know what? They cannot afford it. I think what we need to do is we need to support those children. We, even if we have to offer them free lunch, all fingers are not equal, guys. There, there are people from out there, there are people from low there. We need to support our children. We need to make sure that those kids who are poor, for whatever reason, the district, we need to support them. It's a responsibility. It's a moral responsibility that we need to support them and stop playing games. Social economic disparity is here to stay and it's part of this country. I'll leave that there. Thank you. Maureen Jones, please. We really need to support our families. Um, we know our families that are facing social economic status issues really need a lot of support. And we as a community have a responsibility to ensure that all our families are brought into our school community. So we have to look through our community to see what kind of resources that we can provide for our students, whether it's through school or after school. Also providing scholarships and stipends for a different variety of programs that the school offers should be afforded to those families as well. Thank you. Donna Smith, please. Uh, well, as I said before, I think that, that perhaps we need to uh, reinvigorate our commitment to the Seth Boyden Demonstration School. Um, I've heard tales of, of dwindling numbers of opt-in students, and um, I think that's a shame. I think it, it has to do partly with the fact that, once again, we implemented the program and we had a lot of great fanfare at the beginning, but slowly over the years, I think there's been less emphasis on it. We need to. We need to show um, the good, goodness of that school and what's going on there and, and how it can attract um, other students to opt in. And perhaps that will help us to um, make the ratio a little bit better at Seth Boyden. And so it's one of the things that I think we really need to concentrate on. Elizabeth Baker, please. As an initial step, I think we need to recognize that every single family that lives in South Orange and Maplewood is here intentionally because they want the best for their children. Whether you're a family that's low income, whether your family is working and paying rent from one check to the next, or your family of significant means, the decision to move to our district is a very intentional decision because you want the best for your children. And I think that's a mindset that we need to bring into every school and every classroom. I agree with Maureen that we need to do as much as possible to make sure that families are welcome, that our schools are transparent and easy to navigate. Whether you're 
whether you're a family that recently immigrated or whether you're a family that's lived here in New Jersey and has means and has been here for, in our community for 30 years. Secondly, as we're implementing new programs, we have, to, we have to actually think practically about how we're going to make sure that those programs are accessible to all children. We don't talk about the digital divide enough. We implement programs like ST Math, you know, without making sure that every school is actually opening the doors of its computer labs and making those programs available and successful to all children. Thank you. This next question is directed to Maureen Jones, but I'm sure you will all want to answer it, and it kind of ties in with what you answered a little earlier. What ways can the cultural mindset be shifted? In other words, how can parents who are not able to be more involved in their children's school success be assisted? So you will go first. We need to provide a welcoming atmosphere to our families. All our families, regardless of whether or not English is their first language, to whether or not there is a socioeconomic status issue are all part of this community. We need to ensure that we provide literature and information about school in different languages. We need to make it accessible to parents and we need to provide them as, with resources to help them navigate the system whenever possible. We call ourselves a diverse district. So we, in order to represent and show ourselves as a diverse district, we need to ensure that we're welcoming everyone on different levels and in different ways. Thank you. Dr. Malcolm? Well, we first of all gotta open the door for these people to come. We have to show them we are listening. The, the town we live in is diverse culturally, different people from different parts of the world. Open the door, we have to have a language line where they can communicate. The door should be open for them and not closed. We have to get someone who speaks their language, who are, they are very comfortable to communicate with them. If everything shouldn't be in English language, guys. Spanish people, get a Spanish speaking or bilingual person who can communicate with them. When we send messages home to their folks, the children, send it in their language as well. Have somebody who can communicate with them. They, they, they should have a line where they can call and ask questions. They don't have to wait 48 hours to get their point across. Guess what? They feel left behind, no wanted, and that's not right. Okay, so we should have bilingual, transparency, open access for everyone, and support them. Talk is cheap. You gotta support them. Thank you. Thank you. This is the paper, please. I think I No, I, I started with Maureen, and then uh, so you're number three on that one. In terms of the question was, um, how can parents who are not able to be more involved in their child's school success be assisted? Again, I don't think our schools should be a game of inside baseball. We need to make information easy to access, clear, and timely. I think too many of us have had the experience where it takes 20 phone calls or emails to get a basic question answered, to understand what the resources are in our children's school, and to, and to actually interact with someone who might be making a decision about our children's lives. I think that is something that all parents uh, would appreciate and would make parents true partners, or the first step to true partnership um, in our in our children's education. Thank you. And Donna Smith, please. This has been a long-standing issue in this district, and I think that um, what we need to do is, rather than just inviting parents in, um, and then seeing that we're not we're not getting all of the folks in who we really need to to help. Um, we need to do more outreach, and not just through the typical emails to through the district email system. Um, board members need to to get out into the community um, to talk to parents and find out what their needs are. We need to make the um, the guidance departments uh, provide much better help to students who whose parents don't know how to negotiate the system and who don't know what the, their options are instead of letting the students fall behind because they simply didn't know that they needed to ask for something. This is, a, this is of a paramount importance if we want to raise up students in, in our schools. Thank you. Next question. I'm going to try to come, combine two questions here, but I'm having trouble with the handwriting. <laughs> the ACLU has filed a complaint against the South Orange Maplewood School District 
based on something that I can't read. Anyway, I understand that the complaint is asking, the ACLU complaint is asking for a complete deleveling of the district. Are you in favor of this? Please explain. The first person to speak would be Donna Smith. I feel that it's unfortunate that the complaint has been filed and that uh, we could not handle the, the issues that the ACLU has with our district um, in-house, as it were. Um, I don't think that deleveling de is the answer to the achievement gap issues that, um, that need to be addressed. I do, however, however, believe that we can continue to work to improve upon the implementation of the levels and, as I've stated before, work on addressing the needs of students at the earlier stages so that they are prepared for the high school and have the opportunity to move up. I also agree wholeheartedly that access to high honors and AP courses uh, needs to be increased. And finally, I think that the new principal at the high school has the energy and resolve to make that happen. So um, I'd rather try to resolve these issues through the district rather than from outside sources. Thank you. Elizabeth Baker, would you like to respond to that? Sure. I don't believe our current system, even in the somewhat semi level middle school, is serving the needs of most children. I think we have not um, provided sufficient opportunity when still today, children will be on the track to get to calculus or not based on how they tested in fourth and fifth grade. That is not best practice, and I think the ACLU complaint makes it clear that other districts have tried different approaches and are having greater success. I hope that our district can own this problem. I'm not going to comment on the specifics of uh, a legal matter, but clearly systems that are tracking a child from fifth grade on, even in our somewhat D-level middle school, and determining where they're going to be in high school and going into college are not best practices. These children are 9, 10, and 11. Their transcripts should not be bit written for life based on how they performed on an NJS or a math placement test. So I think we have to really look at, at how we are uh, creating opportunity, how we are ch challenging our, our children who are high achievers, but also how we are truly engaging in differentiated instruction, which I think we really have not uh, explored enough of at all levels in the district. Thank you. Governor Malakou, please. Whenever there's a lawsuit, it makes it impossible for the two parties or individuals to communicate. I know that this case has been going on for quite some time, about leveling and deleveling. You know, it, it depends on who you talk to. If you ask my son, for example, my son said that, you know what, because I seek his opinion, he's, he's a high school senior, he said that, you know, leveling is very good, I don't want to be in a boring class and get, get distracted, so I think it's good. It's, it's, you don't want to agree with uh, Elizabeth. There's a lawsuit going on, and it's not appropriate for us to comment on that. But Levin has its merits, and if he can be in that, I don't think that's going to close the achievement gap. I think the two parties need to get together and find a way to solve this problem. Thank you. Warren Jones, please. As this is a legal matter, our district is still going through the issue of the details, but this is an important issue that we've been grappling with as a community. While we may have made some inroads in the level in the middle school and IB, we still have a long way to go. We have to look at access to all subjects, particularly math, science, and AP. We're one of the few districts that still requires um, test entry to AP. And it's not necessarily a matter of keeping kids in AP, but making sure that we're allowing kids the opportunity to have access to AP. And so we have to encourage and support our kids to take these courses and provide them with the proper support in order to make that happen. Thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question. Um, let's be specific. If you think that the South Orange neighborhood schools have gotten worse in the past years, what was the Board of Ed's biggest mistake and what would you have done differently? If you think the schools have improved, what was the board's decision that had the greatest positive effect? And the first person to speak is Elizabeth Baker. I think 
think we can't say categorically that our district is better or worse than it was you know, five years or ten years ago. I think there are areas where we've made progress. I think there are initiatives that we undertook in recent years, full day kindergarten is one, that have really great, created greater opportunity for kids and I think have been very beneficial to families in our district. Um, I also, I support our embracing of IB and our attempt to invigorate uh, the, the middle school uh, pedagogical uh, experience and to bring that energy and intellectual rigor into our classrooms. I think where we've really struggled is in finding a way to listen to parents to create dialogue with teachers and to learn from feedback. We've really been you know, operating as if we have blinders on, and I think much of the anxiety and the frustration that boils over is from that lack of communication. Thank you. Donna Smith, please. Um, I also can't say that, that I feel that the school district has gone up or down. Um, I think that along with what Elizabeth said, that there are things that we've done that are good and that some things that are not so good. Um, the pre-K program, the early reading program, the all-day kindergarten, these are great steps towards the early stages of, of education that we really need to address if we want to improve um, the education for students throughout the district. Um, some of the things that I think are, have been bad are the way we implement programs. We, we often get enthusiastic about a new program, bring it in, and forget to establish goals for the, for the program and ways of measuring success for it so that we have no real basis for evaluating it and making sure that it's, it's doing what we wanted it to do. Um, so I think that we really need to change the way we implement programs um, because sometimes they may not really do what, what we wanted and they, they're not successful. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen Jones, please. Um, I would agree with Elizabeth. Our district has made some progress. Um, it's not a matter of whether it was worse or better. We've had some things that we've done well, and we have some things that we could have improved on. Um, when we look at our reading intervention programs that have been implemented, our math programs and interventions and IB, those are all programs and things that we have benefited from, that our students have benefited up from as a district. Our area that's been our most concerning, I think that we can continue to do better with, is how we communicate with our families and how we share information and how the district makes it itself accessible to the families. So I think we as a district need to continue to look at that and see how can we continue to do that better and how can we bring families into the mix and how can we continue to share information on a much more continuous basis. Thank you. And God, please. Thank you. Guys, I can't believe that much opponents can look at you straight on your face and say that the district have done well. No, they haven't done well. Take a look at where we were a couple of years ago. Columbia High School, 96. How could you say that? I track these numbers every year because I was once a school teacher. How can they, I mean, how can anyone say that they've done well when you outsource most of the programs? When you outsource services, you know what they do? They are profit oriented. A lot of hospitals outsource most of their pro guess what? To get a CAT scan done. I can make a phone call and get a CAT scan done. Now, you have to fill out 15 pages. Many of you who have worked with HMO, I do that every day, try to get something for my patient. It took three days to get an approval for a simple x-ray. When the state was in charge of all this insurance. I can order cash can and get it within 24 hours. The district, shame on them. They haven't done well. They failed our children. Take a look at where we were 17 years ago when I moved in this town. We are much better. And I continue to say this. If we were like this 17 years ago, I would have taken my children elsewhere. It's a shame. But guess what? I got good news for you guys. My candidacy was no one supports me. I don't want money from anybody. I'm going to speak for you. I don't care how you feel about it. When all these unnecessary expenses, I'm going to put a stop to the, the district. Shame on them. They failed our children and they continue to do that. We need to stop that. Mm -hmm. Collectively. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We are now to the closing part of the evening. Um, the closing statements will be given in the opposite order of the opening statements. So the two minutes each will be allotted uh, to the candidates. And the first person 
to speak will be Maureen Jones. I have sat in the classroom where I didn't understand the language. I've taught children who didn't understand how to communicate. I've helped families understand how to get children to succeed, and I've reached families to be part of the school community. Improvement in our schools should be something we do with our teachers and not to our teachers. What I bring to the board is how successful change happens because I've worked in a school. We have to manage spending wisely. We have to enable our teachers to succeed. We have to make parents full partners in their children's education. And we have to make communication and listening a part of everything we do. And we need to ensure that each child is not bored, that no child is bored, and that they encounter challenge, rigor, and opportunity in every classroom. I've seen districts do this. It is possible to do this, even though it is not easy, and I know our district can do it. I ask for your vote on November 4th, so I can, as one of the members of the board, school board, can help make that happen. And I urge you to support my friend and running mate, Elizabeth Baker, who is eminently qualified to, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Smith, please. I care very much about the quality of education being provided to the students in our school district. And I'm ready to step up to the challenge of serving on the Board of Ed. I believe that I can be a consensus builder, something that is sorely needed at this time, so that the district can move forward. We have a lot of programs and issues that we need to address in the near future and for the long term, and I think that I can help with that. My long-standing involvement in and knowledge of the district will allow me to hit the ground running. My leadership roles here and elsewhere, coupled with my professional skills, can add real value to the board's operations. I know how to get things done, how to listen, and how to lead. If elected, my priorities will be addressing the needs of all students, from those with special needs to those who are gifted and talented, and providing challenging coursework for all. Supporting the teachers in order to be able to effectively provide this type of instruction, proper implementation and evaluation of programs, and ensuring, and, and ensuring that we are spending our limited resources wisely. I am ready to get to work and look forward to meeting the challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Governor Mullican, please. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming here today. You've heard it all from all the candidates. You know, a lot of people ask me, Dr. Muru, why don't you get involved with the school system? Looking at your past, I say, you know what? Why? Why should I? They say, because you have the experience. You're one of those people who can get up and speak. You're one of those people who make things happen. And we are once a school teacher. You know, I've been to several schools since I've been here. I've been involved in my children's uh, education right from the time ago. I make time for that because the future of our children depends on us. Okay? Collectively, we can make things. We can change things. You'll be surprised how powerful we can be if we join forces together. I want you guys to, when you go home, listen to all of us one more time in your head and say to yourself, who has the guts to challenge the district? I do, okay? I don't want any special interest. I don't need money from anyone. I'm running my campaign solely on my own because you know why? I care about your children. Enough is enough. This the, the school district is not doing well, guys. Please, take a look at Livingston, where most of my colleagues live, Edison, and see how the kids are doing. Most of the kids that go to Ivy's, Ivy League schools, most of the doctors in the hospital, all their kids go to Ivy League school. They say, well, why do you want to do this? I say, no, what well, we have to bring change. It's about time. Business as usual is not going to continue. I need your vote. I need you to help me. And I'm going to ask you this. Just give me a chance. If I don't perform well, I will resign. Okay? I will get involved in the lunch system. I'm going to have lunch with the children. I'll make time. Some of them complain about the food. I'm going to bring changes. I'm happy guts, and I can do it. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the audience for coming out. <laughs> Last but not least. Oh, we saved the best 
for less. My apologies. I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight and to thank you for your commitment and your concern about our children and our schools. That's why we're all here. That's why we've chosen to live in South Orange Maplewood. We are at a critical point in our school district. We are looking for new leadership and we are dealing with some very serious issues that require frank discussion and hard work. Sometimes the work seems to be getting harder, but I believe in making opportunities out of obstacles. I'm committed to making our board and our district leadership more accessible and visible in our community, to guiding the hard work that we have to do from principles of dialogue and partnership, and welcoming all families into the district. At the same time, I can, as many of you know, ask tough questions. And I ask tough questions not to play the blame game or to point a finger, but to make sure that we are focused on the goal of providing opportunity and challenge for every child every day. Our challenges are made more difficult because of the financial constraints we're under. And the budget is a weedy issue, but it requires discipline and it requires transparency and it requires us to work with incredible coordination to make sure that we are exacting maximum educational benefit for every dollar we spend. In my professional life, I've learned to reach across the aisle, not just to call for change, but to work with others, including those who disagree with me, to find common ground and move forward. No one board member has all the answers, and no one board member, just like the superintendent, you know, can't do it. No one board member can do it alone. I look forward to, and I'm humbled by the opportunity to serve this district, and I look forward to working with other board members, including great, talented leaders like Maureen Jones, to serve our schools. The candidates you elect on November 4th will choose the next superintendent, but choosing the next superintendent is really just the beginning of our collective work. I hope tonight you've gotten a better sense of my commitment and the value that I hope to add to the Board of Education and the skills as an advocate, a parent, and someone who's experienced making change happen to work for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. It's sometimes hard to keep track of who's speaking when. I want to thank the audience for coming out and especially the candidates who are willing to give up their time and energy to make the South Orange Maplewood School District a better district. Thank you to the League, to the PTA, PTO President's Council, um, and to all of you who hopefully will remember to come out and vote on November 4th and cast an informed vote. If you have any questions about issues or what's on the ballot, go to lwbnj.org, and it's all there for you, explained in a nonpartisan way. Thank you again, and I'm turning the program back over to Michelle. It's my pleasure to have been able to present this. Thank you for coming, thank you to the candidates, and thank you to the audience. I want to remind you that you can get information about the ballot issues and information about other things from the League of Women Voters, lwvnj.org. In the back of the room, we have voter uh, registration applications and vote by mail applications, uh, as well as information about the League. Polls will be open on November 4th from 6 in the morning to 8 at night. We don't say vote early, vote often, but we do say vote early and bring a friend to vote. Make an informed decision. And this is not the last event the League of Women Voters of Maplewood South Orange is putting on. We will have a Maplewood Township Committee Forum on October, Thursday, October 23rd at the DeHart Community Center, 7.30. Hope to see you there. Thank you.